three, two, one, and you're on. Okay. Do we need an official introduction? Yeah, introduce yourself. You know, I'm Sadie from Vidmag. I'm Sadie. I'm from Vidmag. Joe Ramon. He's not from Vidmag. He's from. Oh, from the Ramon. From the Ramon. Right. You may have guessed that. And we're here in Columbus. You might have guessed that, you know. Talking about whatever we came to talk about. Talking about your non-tour. I guess it's not an official tour. No, we just tour. Uh, we've been on tour all year. We've been. Um, in Europe, because mm -hmm. the band's really big there now, and uh, so we spend most of our time there. And uh, we just came back from a month tour of Spain, uh, where we, uh, we recorded a live album in Barcelona that's coming out uh, this okay. summer, and uh, it's going to contain about 32 songs or so. And uh, pretty much the sounds, same sounds set. great. Pretty well, pretty, pretty much, much the same, but there's some additional songs. There's, uh, um, like ignorance to bliss and carbon and not glue and a whole, whole bunch of you know. So it's really good. Sounds great. You know. So it's th this isn't the tag end of that tour so much or just. No, just we just because we we're always touring whether we have a new album out at night and. Um, play. Yeah, we we like to play and. Uh, Any and particular reason why the Midwest area? Do well, we got a we got a really good offer to play Detroit. Mm -hmm. Show tomorrow. I, I think it's a new a new club or something. All right. And I think um, it's sort of like um, they want us to uh, christen it or you something. Know, it, huh? <laughs> right. And uh, so since we, you know, since we got the off off of the Detroit, we uh, decided to do it like a short midwestern you know, stint, which uh, we did Allentown, Pennsylvania yesterday, and tonight uh, Columbus, and then. Uh, more as Detroit, and then I think it's Cincinnati, and then Pittsburgh. Oh, and, uh, and we haven't been here in a while, so it's it's fun to be back. And then we do uh, a South American tour, leaving on 24th, and we're doing uh, Brazil and, uh, and Argentina. Brazil's a pretty big country for a lot of underground music, isn't it? Seems like yeah, well, they're, they're, really, there. they're really on the ball. I mean, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, a lot of European countries are, you know, they really don't know too much or, you know, you'd be really surprised, like we played Yugoslavia for the first time a couple of months ago and uh, they're really, they, they're like a, a lot hipper than a lot of like American mm -hmm. cities. <laughs> you know, they, they know everything that's going on in America and they know everything that's, you know, they know all about music history and uh, everything. And, I know uh, there's Cleveland bands that have done like Perubu for one did far better in Europe than they ever did, certainly in Cleveland. <laughs> well, they, yeah. they understand certain kinds of music a lot better over mm -hmm. there. I mean, uh, more music and, you know, more uh, innovative music or original music they really get off on. I mean, they like, they really love us over there because we pioneered a whole a whole new sound and style that, uh, that everybody sort of has um, adapted to their styles and kind of interjected themselves, you know, creating their own whatever, you know. But I mean, nowadays, I mean, the Ramon sound is really kind of the sound, and especially, you know, in European bands, English bands, but um, really, in, in everything that's really good, you know, right from uh, the Sex Pistols through uh, to Metallica to Jane's Addiction or uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers or whatever it is, you know. And it makes you feel good, you know, because, uh, we never really got our justice in America as far as, you know, maybe chart success or whatever, or radio play or whatever, but um, we always maintained and we always kind of did it on our own terms and we never compromised ourselves and we never, um, we always uh, main retained our, um, our initial vision and um, morals and ideals and, um, and uh, so, you know, you feel really good about people, you know, kind of adapting your sound to their styles too. Your you know? sound has been pretty long lasting. I mean it stayed it stayed pretty much true to itself over the years. Yeah, I mean and like I mean it's it's an exciting sound and style and uh, and it's exciting hearing it in like in the in the uh, foundations of bands like Jane's Addiction and stuff who I really like. You know, mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I love the new album. I think it's uh, one of the most refreshing records I've heard or 
bands. I've heard he is, you know, because they're really, uh, Perry, he's really creative and artistic. And that album, uh, the new album, second album, it's like uh, just loaded with great stuff. It's really exciting. And well, really, they're strong. They really have their own sound and their own yeah, identity. But, you know? Yeah, they have a, a real vision and real personality. Every song has yeah. got its own characteristics and personality. And I mean, it's all like three days. I mean, I haven't heard anything that like exciting or you know, since maybe the '60s or something. <laughs> for as um, I mean, that's like a that song's like an odyssey. You know what I mean? It's like about a, a good 10, 15 minute song or so, but I've, it just keeps changing it, and evolving. Really, oh, it's fucking. I don't great. have the new one it's, yet. It's, 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 it's great. It's yeah. great. It's great. It's not like listening to a, to a record. Yeah. I mean, like there's a lot of great bands out now, but um, but this is like a real experience mm -hmm. because it's like. It's not just one style, it's, it's so many styles, but it's really, it's, blended it's really like woven, layers. like it's like, it's like amazing. It's really like genius, I think. Well, I guess if we're talking about other bands, we could mention Motorhead and their I always love Motorhead, and that's, to me, it's like a real ultimate honor because, um, you know, Lenny, like ourselves, Motorhead, like ourselves, have always maintained their credibility and, and integrity and always, uh, had a vision and stuck by it too. And yeah. always, uh, you know, I mean, I feel, you know, them and ourselves are like the, the two bands that really, you know, stuck to it and really go out there and blow you away, you know? And um, in a lot of ways, I see Lenny, um, I mean, them, him writing, you know, the band writing the song uh, as a tribute to, to ourselves. I mean, I mean, bands like that, first of all, don't write tributes to other bands, yeah. people that have been out there struggling for so many years. Um, but I, so that's even makes it better. And, um, and a lot, I mean, Lemmy's like a real meaty kind of guy, you know, a, a, a Motorhead is a band with substance and, um, and in a lot of ways, to me, it's almost as if, you know, in, in the, you know, there's like, um, I don't know, it could have been, I mean, I kind of see like Lemmy doing this, it's almost like, as if you know, like John Lennon, the equivalent of John Lennon writing a song about it. You know what I mean? Because uh, in the nineties, really aren't any. There aren't people, or rock people, or anything. There are very few people that really are unique individuals that really have uh, distinct personality and character and color. You know? So much of it, especially with at least to me, it seems like a lot of what comes out of LA is so just you know rubber stamped. I mean, there's so much. Everything is so superficial. Mm -hmm. um, now and before, and I mean, there aren't many people. I mean, there aren't in the '60s. There were like you know unique individuals like uh, you know John Lennon, the Beatles. Uh, there was Hendrix. There was you know Jim Morrison. There was whoever there was. I mean, yeah, Stones and the right. Kinks and the Stooges and <laughs> the MC5. I mean, everybody was distinct and unique. And nowadays, everybody's a clone of a clone. These people don't have the slightest idea why they're in rock and roll. I mean, it's just um, an ego thing and, uh, you know, a pickup thing and, you know, way ahead we're in a rock and roll band, you know. And, like, um, you know, they, they have no mind, you know, and uh, nothing unique or, you know, it's just total white bread, you know. So much of it's been packaged and sold to young people, too, though, you know. I mean, it's to be a rock star is dangled in front of you just like to be a sports star or anything else. It's not... It's not a rebellious. Uh, there's there's an element of it. Certainly, punk there is much more. But oh yeah, well, there's know. no rebellion whatsoever in like heavy metal nowadays, oh. or uh, <laughs> or or you know whatever the, you know the so-called you know rock and roll of, of the you know of yeah. the late '80s and '90s. I mean, there's really there's nothing really very much. I mean, there's there's like a. a a minority of people who are doing really good things, you know, like the Chili Peppers and, uh, and you know, Jane's Addiction and, um, uh, who else? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, I, I like Ministry myself. I think they, you know, them and their various spin off bands are, you know, I mean, that's a different genre of music. Yeah, no, I, but, uh, yeah, well, no, but they're included mm -hmm. because they're part, the minor, they're part of the minority. But I mean, the minority is getting a lot larger, and also the minority isn't like a subculture anymore. It's it's an above cult, you know, mm -hmm. culture kind of thing. That's really um, kind of the the dominant force because even though it's a small amount of of, of of people that are doing good things, they're definitely an influence.
influence on on the majority because those people want to be cool. They want to they want to be right. doing something that's that's uh, you know got credibility. They want to yeah. be credible. Yeah, you know what I mean? yeah. And it, it's unfortunate that people don't learn how to develop their own credibility a lot of times. No, they, they that's why they they all sound like. <laughs> You know, Whoever like, is currently you know, the one to Right, about. right. That kind of the industrial thing, they'll sound like, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Or uh, they'll sound like, you know, it seems like everybody's you know, trying to sound like, like the Chili Peppers now. Or, or yeah, the funk metal sound. Right, I mean, just the way everyone tries to sound like the Ramones, too, except, uh, <laughs> but the Ramones have always sort of, you know, it's like um, the commercialism has never been with us, and and it's always been more obscure, but uh, I like that. And, uh, I wanted to ask you um, how well you've done, or maybe not well, with all your videos and stuff. Have you had much trouble getting them shown? Or? Yeah, we were always censored by MTV. We were, matter of fact, the first um, band to be censored. Uh, oh, which really? I, nev I never understood because psychotherapy, um, to oh, me, was to was you know <laughs> was great art. I felt. Uh -huh. But the, at the same, but right uh, around the time that psychotherapy came out, Thriller came out. And like, um, to me, that's offensive, and that's violent, and that's yeah, that's good. You know, I mean, good. um, I wouldn't want, you know, my five-year-old daughter <laughs> watch. I mean, you know what I mean? I don't think mine have seen through. Um, <laughs> I mean, I would. I I mean, I don't have one, but I, <laughs> but I mean, it's just that. Um, I think that's yeah. Well, I know my kids would be scared by that. That's sick. Right that now. was you know. I mean, but uh, but they know the lyrics to beat on the brand. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we have a home video out now called Lifestyles of the Ramones that's uh, done very well, and uh, it's you know, the fucked up thing about it is, it it like it was because um, gold on on for home video is um, certified was certified twenty five thousand. We we were twenty three thousand, and we were like two thousand away from from gold status, which you know we never got, we never had anything that that was gold yet. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, really? it was really exciting because it's it's it really took off and um, no, not here, and um, and it was exciting, you know, that it was going to be um, you know because it was outselling Madonna and <laughs> Faith No More. It was it was like um, <coughs> the top five, the best top best out of you know like a, like out of a hundred home videos, it was top five. Mm. Um, was you know really cool. So is it like a collection of the videos you've done or live stuff? Or uh, really? Yeah, it's well no, it's uh comp there's all the videos we've done. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them are being unreleased and uh, it's, uh, it's the um, the uncensored versions of a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And then it's uh, interviews with ourselves, um, um, with CJ's also, and um, and then it's interviews with. Like fans of ourselves, mm -hmm. like people like uh, you know, Debbie Harry and Talking Heads and and uh, Vernon Reed and uh, Anthrax and uh, mostly people from around New York area. Um, no, no, the people, people there are people from California. California oh, too. Okay. <laughs> I mean, there's some of the you know Seymour Stein from Sire Records and uh, matter of fact, there's a story. There's a there's a thing with uh, that Chris Isaac. Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, when he was a bouncer or whatever, he used to work with Bill Graham. It's a really funny story about uh, that on the home video too, and uh, it's really it's really well done. You know, it's really it was done well. And um, now now gold is fifty thousand, so we kind of um, oh, got, we so got, got a ways to go. We huh? got screwed. You know, we were like first we were like two thousand away, and now it, we're like twenty seven thousand. Well, let's get everybody out there to go out and pick one up. And, yeah. Uh, what and, is and we have a new um, in the series, the CD series that we have. Uh -huh. um, the next one's coming out May 25th. It's uh, comprised of Rock to Rush, Road to Ruin. Plus okay, that's, that's the re releases. Right? Yeah. yeah. It's Jeff two for the price of one because these are hard times. And uh, <laughs> four bonus tracks, which have never been released except for one uh, song. But it's but it's the original version of um, I Want You Around that uh, the, there's another version on the Rock and Roll High School soundtrack. This is the original version, and then there's a bunch of films that we're um, we we um, we're in this new film called Car 54 that's coming out uh, this summer. It's supposed to be a major summer release, and it's Based sort of on the series. 
Yeah, it's loosely based around the original TV show uh -huh. of the uh, 50s and 60s. And but it's a 90s version. And, uh, and it was directed by Bill Fishman, who um, last year he put out that film Tape Heads. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I've heard he, of it. I didn't see it, but I heard it was really good. And uh, he also uh, did four of our videos in, in the past. He did, uh, uh, he did uh, something to believe in. Was that it? Something to believe in. That one I'm not familiar with. Was that it? That was <laughs> one. Yeah. Okay. And he did, that was uh, the one with all the uh, all the guest appearances. Right, right, right. And I want to be sedated, and I want to live, and Pet Cemetery. He, he directed those videos. And then uh, we have songs in a bunch of films that are coming out. Uh, one called Highway 61, which um, uh, th is directed by this guy named Bruce McDonald, who had done a film called Roadkill. I had a small part in that, and we had a song in that. And it's, uh, I think it's like a brilliant film. It's real, it's a, it's a rock and roll film, but not like any rock and roll film I don't think anyone's ever seen. It's really black humor-esque and uh, I think it's the sickest film I've ever seen, but it's really like autistic, you know. It's like really autistic, you know. It's really. Uh, well, this isn't a Richard Kern film, there. No, nah, uh, actually, it won. Um, it's a it's a uh, a Canadian release, and uh, mm -hmm. it won best film in the Toronto Film Festival in 1989. It was David uh, Cronenberg's favorite film of '89, and, and it, it it didn't really play in America. It played everywhere else, but not in America. And uh, this is his like second offering. Hopefully, you'll, uh, you'll be able to get Roadkill here soon or something. Or home video or something. Yeah, of course. And I'll, I'll, send, I'll get you guys a copy so you can see it. Cool. That'd be great. And, yeah, it's really good. It's really, I mean, everything is tied in with everything else. You know what I mean? It's like amazing. You, you know? gotta pay attention you to You really gotta pay detail? attention. Yeah, yeah but cool. it's, like it's the kind of film you gotta, you watch a couple of times. Uh -huh. Every time you see it, you see something new that you didn't see before. And it's really, like, great, you know? And, um, and then also we're supposed to have a song in um, Terminator 2, but um, we're waiting to hear, you know, because it's still, um, we're still working on the film. And uh, if it, they said if it's not on the cutting room floor, it'll be in the film. <laughs> <laughs> well, that tells you a lot. Yeah, right? and, uh, and uh, Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll is the new uh, Eric Bogosian film, and we're supposed to have a song in that too. And, and then there's some additional stuff. There's a film called uh, Kill Billies that's in the works. And and they offered me a, a role, which I'm kind of excited by. And also, and that's really, that was like really um, kind of brilliantly well thought out. It's like, it's a horror film, but it's really uh, clever. Uh-huh. And uh, what else? I don't know. We have a Bud commercial out. A friend of mine was telling me that she had heard you guys on a commercial. I hadn't heard it. Yeah, that, it's, uh, like, uh, it's, like a, it's like the wildest thing I've ever seen. It's not like anything you've... And it's really well done. It's really, you know, artistic and it's funny. It's like clever, you know. And, um, and I think it's pretty hip of like the Anheuser-Busch people to ask us because um, that's, you know, pretty Are you, cool. Are you actually in it? No, we, just, we have a song and we didn't want to do anything like that. But it's like, it's really well done. It's like, we, you know, we, we check uh, Budweiser's background to make sure they were, there were no connections <laughs> with the uh, KKK or any of that stuff. Like Coors and Miller, yeah, you know? and uh, and they're a real cool company. They're very open-minded and they're very um, pro rock and roll. You know, they're mm. very supportive, and that's great. You know, I guess they do a lot of those spring break things too. Yeah, right? but they you know, they got a good <laughs> product. I mean, product, you know, so. everybody drinks Budweiser, right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 not uh, not beer drinkers, I guess. But, yeah. Right. <laughs> and what else is there? I don't know. Uh, no, no, feed us something. I'm sure there's something that I forgot to tell you. Stiv. Oh, Stiv, yeah. That's right. Well, um, when Stiv died, and you know, me, me and Stiv were pretty close. And uh, matter of fact, I remember like the first time I met him, it was in, uh, in Youngstown, Ohio, at the Tomorrow Theater. And um, he, um, the whole band was there. The Cramps were there too. I remember. And he said, um, move, he said, uh, you know, once you guys come over, we're having a party, you want to come, you know, come, come to, you know, with us, you know, so, so we said, all right, so he said, well, just follow us, and we'll, like, show you how to get there, you know, so we were following him, and 
they were driving about 90 miles an hour, you know, and we we're following. And all of a sudden, Bader's like, he climbs out of the uh, driver's side on, to, on the roof of the car. And he's like driving the car, but he's on, on top of the <laughs> roof. And um, he like starts mooning us, you know. And I thought, I thought at the time, this is like the sickest thing I've ever seen. And so, um, so we became friends, you know. And um, I got him a show at CBGB's in New York, and it was the first show they had done in, in New York. And I invited like all the press down and all the really cool people down, like Spin Magazine and all that. And um, and I I I, I uh, talked. Hilly into uh, giving him a, a, you know, getting getting him a, a show, and I never, you know, I hadn't seen him yet or nothing, but I just believed that they'd be fucking great, and uh, and they were, they were amazing. From one mooning incident, huh? They landed there. Yeah, well, it was it was just pretty wild, you know, it was pretty wild, and, and it, we were hanging out at swingos and all that shit, and it was like it was cool, and um, and I got to be good friends with them, and uh, and Stip was very unique. He was. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of people who, who don't know the guy would think he's just, you know, whatever, you know, but he's a real sensitive guy, and, uh, and you know, he was really pretty special, so um, when he died, and, you know, it was, it was pretty upsetting, and it was, it was a real shock, you know, yeah. that it was him, and not, you know, Johnny Thunders and something <laughs> like that. And he was and, uh, a little closer to the edge, maybe. Yeah, it, it's... Uh, um, so I called Carol and I, uh, I told her that, you know, because I knew uh, this new thing he was working on, because he had called me like from Paris and asked me if I wanted to sing on some tracks and he told me you know, they were bringing Dee Dee out there to work on some songs and stuff, which I heard was like, um, forget it, <laughs> you know, and um, so, you know, I, I offered to um, produce and mix the tracks, you know, that he had been working on. And, um, and she, you know, was pretty touched, you know, but, and she, uh, you know, felt that, you know, if anyone understood him, that I'd be, you know, best suited, you know, to do this. And um, so when we were on the escape from New York tour this summer, I, I, I told Chris Stein about it, and he said, well, let, let's do it together. So we're going to do it together, you know. And, like, the songs are, like, the best fucking songs that I'd ever heard. Um, it's like really a shame that he went when he did because he was really, you know, working on making a comeback. Um, and he had this new band called uh, The Whores of Babylon, and the songs are like great and real thorough, you know what mm. I mean? Uh, so it wouldn't be a Lord's release then? No. Actually, the songs are all different. I mean, there's a, one song called Do You Believe in Magic that uh, is great, really. And um, dark and moody, and uh, real touching and real, uh, very haunting, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, and it was just, I mean, it was so weird hearing a lot of those songs because it was almost like he knew. It was almost like he knew he was he was gonna die. He anticipated it. So yeah, well. because the, I mean, some of those songs are just really intense and really leave you kind of feeling real strange and uh, very haunting, you know, a lot of them. You know, there was a song called Nobody, and that was really, and uh, and then there's a song, um, but it, really great song, it, so, it sounds a lot like a, a Heartbreaker song or something, and I, I guess Johnny Thunder's playing on it too, you know, and um, Actually, this one song, it would be like perfect for Alice Cooper to cover or something. Cause really? I mean, it's great. It's a great song. Old Alice or new Alice? <laughs> um, well, I guess I guess new Alice. Cause oh, I guess that's all there that's is. That's all there right? is these days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really? And, uh, but yeah, so there were six songs that he was working on, and then. And I've I've been hearing about a demo, like twenty song demo. Of, so I haven't heard these songs yet, but I've been hearing it. How so there may be more them. than the six around. Yeah, well, the the last six were the uh, masters from the most current stuff he had uh -huh. been working on, and um, and 
then there's tw a 20 song demo that I guess has been around for a while because a lot of people said, you know, did you hear this song? Did you hear that song? Oh. That he'd well, been playing songs Legendary underground people. takes kind of thing. Yeah, well, not that it got around, but it got around to certain people uh -huh. who, you know, they said, well, have you heard this song? Have you heard that song? You know. So I haven't heard the demos yet, but, um, you know. Mind any of them show up on your project as well, or do you think it'll just stick with the same? No, thing? no, it's going to be a full album. Oh. And it's going to be like, I don't know how many songs are going to be on, on the actual thing, uh, but it's going to be a full you know, album, uh -huh. and it's going to be released, I, I mean a lot of record companies are interested, um, like Sire's interested, and Relativity's interested, and um, so this, um, this uh, woman that works at our management, her name is Andrea Starr, and, and um, she's kind of going to be handling um, the negotiations as far as uh, cool, getting, it. yeah, and, um, and her and Carol like really good friends and stuff. And so, you know, make sure that he gets the best deal. And I heard that Tim Pope wants to do the video for um, the song, Do You Believe in Magic? Really? That's yeah. Interesting. And um, I think like she wants to release a whole some kind of a film project to go along with the album and all this stuff. And, um, and I guess the money is going to go to his family and Really? Hopefully. So is there a target date for when it might be out? Or uh, when no, it's just when, when it's finished it will be released because you know we want to make sure that it, it's great. It's done right. Yeah. 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 And, uh, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so there's, a, there's a really healthy New York music scene and um, and there's a lot of great new bands that um, I think you should know about. A um, band called uh, Luna Chicks. And, uh, yeah. Blitz yeah, it's Spear. not a bass player had a Luna Chicks. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're great. They're yeah. great, you know. And uh, the Cycle Sluts from Hell. And they've been around a little they've been, they've been around. Yeah, they're on tour with Motorhead now in Europe. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, there's and a band called uh, Crown the Good. They're um, like my, one of my favorite new bands. And uh, Manitoba's Wild Kingdom. I have an album out, <laughs> and uh, and they're going to be working on their second album pretty soon. Like Andy, he's been over in Ireland doing this band called the Golden Hordes, and uh, me and him have been working together. We're writing new songs for next Ramones album, which I I didn't talk about yet. But we go in uh, September, and uh, we're going in with Ed Stasey, and the last album he did with us was Too Tough to Die. And, we haven't worked together now in six years, and he's been doing uh, Living Color and Motorhead and people like that. And um, and we're excited. You know, we've been writing a lot of great songs, and also uh, Dee Dee's going to contribute like three songs, and they're really good songs. So um, you yeah. know, I mean, we're all getting along pretty decently, I, I would think, except when Dee Dee badmouths us and talks to Spin <laughs> Magazine and stuff like that. And, um, what's Wendy Williams doing? Uh, Wendy? Yeah. I don't know, but, you know, like, I'm going to have a big party in, uh, in, uh, the fall at the Ritz. Uh, I have them from time to time, and, um, uh, and I asked Richie Stotts, who's a good friend, if, uh, if I could get a, a plasmatics kind of reunion mm -hmm. for the thing, and he, you know, spoke to, um, uh, What's that guy's name? You know, um, you know Wendy and uh, Rod. Huh? Rod. Rod. Yeah. Oh, Rod's so, right. Yeah. So Rod's really into it. So we're gonna do it. Cool. <laughs> You're yeah. All right. So that should be fun. I said we should blow up something really good. You know, like uh, the Ritz. The Ritz. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, but then you couldn't have any more parties there. Yeah, you could blow well, up the Ritz. Okay. Huh? Far from you again. Perfect. with the 90s. Right. I think that's very appropriate. The Farfic Nugent and, uh... Is, it the, is the new album, um, is it going to be more like Old Ramones or like the Animal Boy, Too Tough to Die, Brain Drain kind of stuff? Um, it's going to be very exciting. You know, it's going to be, um... I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll you just know, have to wait and see. You no, know, I don't know exactly. I know um, I've been writing a lot of songs for for it that I'm really excited by, and uh, they're really you know hard and fast, and uh, 
and they have a lot of depth. And uh, actually, one one of the songs I've been writing, it's called Censorship. And it's, um, it's about what all the shit that's going down now with uh, PMRC and yeah. just getting worse in America. I mean, it's uh, crazy that the rest of Europe doesn't have any sort of censorship whatsoever, but it's all here, and we're supposed to be the advanced the country. The free country, right. The free country, the liberated country, and what, yeah. you know, you say, what the fuck's going you on? You can't play fuck on the radio. Either. Right. Well, at least not. <laughs> oh, can right. we say radio. it on a cable show? Oh, okay, we can't say on the cable show. You can bleep it, right? And um, well, also, I, I have a radio show, but right now it's uh, temporarily on hold on the Z-Rock network in New York oh, City. Yeah. And um, I had like, well, there was two. The one I took over this guy's show, and then he asked me if I want to do my own show. So I said, yeah. And um, and I had, I guess it was in November, and um, and I tried tried making it uh, as exciting and fun and constructive and uh, you know as I could, you know, which I think I did, and. Um, it was a three and a half hour show, and um, we had an uh, anti sense. We had a censorship discussion with the Black Rock Coalition and uh, and Rock the Vote and uh, assorted artists. It was uh, me and Mark Ramon and Dick Manitoba and a bunch of people, and um, I th I, th I thought it was real intense and it was uh, real constructive and because the the kind of audience that. Um, listens to um, the Z-Rock network, or I would say around 16, 17 or so, because the, the, um, the kind of radio satellite station that it is leans hard rock, metal, and thrash, and, mm -hmm. and you know, and um, all these kids, you know, you know, um, everybody, everybody, you know, wants the music, but I mean, you know, everybody needs to per participate so that yeah. the music will, will will we'll live on, let's say. You know we I mean? had C-Rock in Cleveland for a while, and um, they pulled the plug on it because they couldn't, they said they couldn't get enough advertising or the right kind of advertising, but it wasn't for lack of listeners, you know, I mean, people were going crazy when it went off no, the it's, air. No, it's a great, uh, 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 it's a great idea, and it's really cool that it's satellite, and, uh, and um, I don't know, the show that I had done was really, you know, successful, and, uh, and um, I, I interviewed Lemmy, so I got and I, I got a really good interview with him and um, Richie Stotts because um, the Plasmatics and Motorhead had done that uh, "Stand by Your Man" single years back, and um, and it was it was really cool. I mean, everything kind of intertwined with each other, and uh, played a lot of really good stuff. Uh, turning kids on to like the good older stuff that mm -hmm. they probably heard about these bands, but never heard their, their actual right. music, like right. the MC5, and you know. Um, well, because just the, the way the scene is now, there's kids in it who weren't born when right, some of the early stuff was born. coming out. You, you know? know, but uh, so I play. I, I found the original version of Kick Out the Jams, motherfuckers, and I started off the show yeah. with that, and uh, the Stooges, and uh, and the Dictators, and. Bones and all the good stuff, you know, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, and then I had I had Manitoba as my co-host, so it was uh -huh. a lot of fun. And then we interviewed like Cran the Good and and Lemmy, and um, and it was just like a lot of fun. And we had this uh, curator from this film festival um, who was showing all these obscure rock films, and Roadkill was uh -huh. a part of that film festival, and it was really the only place I guess it was shown in America. Wow. And then some film with uh, John Doe. I think it was called Border Radio, and a bunch yeah, of yeah, David uh -huh. Byrne, and you know a bunch of really, you know, probably do video for that. <laughs> huh? Do video. That's what we were talking about in the car. That was, but Joan Jett is in it, or it was like the Runaways. No, it was Jet post post, post Runaways. Yeah, it was post Runaways with Joan Jett in it, but it's it was filled out in the L.A. scene in like the uh, early uh, '80s. Uh. A lot of Ed Culver photographs flush it out. But uh. Yeah, so so it was really good, and um, and then I had gotten um, after that they wanted me to do uh, live shows from here on in, and, and I had gotten a, an actual another hour, so I was going to do a four-hour live show, and I had really good plans for the next one, which I still do, mm -hmm. 
We just thought the band got real busy, so now it's on hold. But you just do it when you can. Yeah, I mean, I then well, what happened was like right before we left for Spain, uh, the program director, of course, K Rock in New York, and Z Rock. That's Z Rock's is, is the sister station of, of K Rock in New York. Mm -hmm. So like he wanted me to do a, a weekly show, mm -hmm. and I was kind I was I was kind of honored by that that he wanted me to do a weekly show, but I I just didn't have the time, you know. So like I um, mean a monthly show was hard enough because there was like three weeks of preparation and this and that, um, pre-production and all that. I guess the fact that the show was on tape, you know, live to tape, uh -huh. and I had gotten a great interview with uh, Johnny Light mm -hmm. too. Like um, I invited him over to my house and. <laughs> and he drank about ten cases of beer, and, and he was just like sh spewing, you know. It's like a lot of people said, "Well, he won't talk about the Sex Pistols, but he talked about everything, man." And I just, I got like the best fucking interview, you know. And um, and that was gonna be like after Motorhead, that was gonna be, you know, I was gonna like feature like an artist Each on the time. show, like yeah, mm -hmm. do like an hour spotlight with words and music, you know, uh -huh. sort of the. Uh, spoken gospel or whatever, <laughs> you know what I mean? And um, right. so like for the next show, which I'm still gonna do, like probably, you know, in the summer or something, mm -hmm. or things uh, ease up a bit. And I, and I had a really good idea um, for um, doing a show like um, with an, you know, like featuring like an A&R person uh -huh. or, you know, and have a phone in thing where kids can, because kids are always giving me their tapes and asking me, well, how, how, what's the best way to break into the, yeah, into the how do business? You get her? Who do you, you know, who, who do you talk? You know what I mean? So this way, you know, they could call and talk to like, uh, like the first A and R guy I was gonna have is a friend of mine named Kevin Patrick. He's head of uh, Island Records, you know, and um, and Michael Alargo who who uh, signed Metallica to Elektra, and um, so you know they could ask them the questions directly and you know and f you know find out if they should hang it up or, or they should uh, <laughs> you know whatever and then we were going to have like uh, play jukebox jury which was a show in england and have like it was going to be me kevin and uh, lisa robinson and um maybe someone who books you know one of the one of the ritz or whatever, uh, the marquee or whatever and like um spin like you know the new releases and kind of critique them and then like spin like uh, demos that we would get, be, and, yeah. you know, and, and supporting like New York bands. Right, you know? right. And um, alternative radio is really good for that. That's you know for helping bands get heard. I mean, right. So, I mean, in New York, there's really no radio. Really? Radio is pretty awful. You know? Cleveland has wonderful college radio. We've got like two really strong stations. Oh, that's great. Right. Of course, I have to support one because I'm with it. But you know, oh, no, that's good but, because uh, it seems like. A lot of college radio now is competing with the mainstream radio because of yeah, they just job placement and all this shit and and, uh, and the ratings and you know the uh, whatever. Right. That's like crazy, you know, because um, college radio was the only thing you could really count on, you know. Oh, I know. I know. You know, on radio, because radio is pretty awful for the most part. You know? And it, and it can be good. It really sucks that it isn't so much of the time because there's so much out there. There's so much that could be heard. Oh yeah. Know, it's not hard to program. Well, it seems that it's, uh, in a lot of ways, it's more the individual, um, like there's, there's a DJ in New York named Vince Skelza who has a really unique radio show. So, um, I thought, yeah, I thought he died. Yeah, I thought he died. <laughs> right, Mr. Cleaver. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so like, well, Skel Vin this guy Vince Skelza, he's got a show that goes from eight in the evening till uh, two in the morning, and mm -hmm. and it's like, <laughs> and it's like a real mixed kind of thing. I mean, like one minute it'll be playing Motorhead, next minute it'll be playing like Pete Seeger or something like that, you know. And uh, it's just really, and he just has, it's a real educational, you know, show. I mean, I learned a lot from it. I mean, his radio used to teach up, used to yeah. turn you on to new ideas and exciting new kinds of music and bands and. The People. earliest punk stuff, that's where I get turned on to it, you know. Yeah, well, Back when MMS would take you or something. <laughs> that was Max. Yeah, or like Patti Smith and stuff, that's where I first heard all of that, you know. I know when I, well, when I was growing ago. up, I guess a few years earlier than you. <laughs> on the AM band, I, you know, that's where I got turned on to like, on everything, you know. And yeah. Then, and, and then traveling around the 
country, like with the Ramones, you know, I mean, getting, you know, like hearing MMS or hearing um, uh, K-San in San Francisco used to be a great station, or mm -hmm. K-Rock K in LA is yeah. still is a great station, right? I mean, being on show and but you, you know, drive across the country and you really get thankful for a tape player in the car, you know? Oh, yeah, like, no, you gotta have a tape player. You gotta have a tape player. Or else, uh, you, 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 you Even coming Cleveland to Columbus, we had to have a tape player, you uh, know? Yeah. Like, we got this guy who's uh, driving, you know, he's helping Monty drive, and uh, he has like a, a CD that has an adapter that, you know, you hook on and you get, uh, Oh, you Not that it, it sounds any good, but uh, well, yeah, but it's cool. It's another you know? option. Yeah, you know? it's another option, right? So, I mean, that's really where I really get to hear music is in the van. Mm -hmm. and we travel in a in a van because uh, you know it's like then you really feel like you're on the road when you're in a van. Yeah. You're closer to to the <laughs> to the road itself. You feel those bumps and potholes. And you feel all the bumps, and you know that you know you're on the road. If you're in a tour bus, you'll you'll miss this. Yeah, so on the long drives, you know, that's where I really, you know, we'll listen to all kinds of different types of uh, bands and different kinds of uh -huh. things. And, it's, uh, and that's where I really get to, because I, I think uh, I enjoy listening to music more when you're traveling, because also you've got nothing to do. So, yeah, yeah, as yeah. long as you're not, well, even when you are driving, you can still keep an ear on it, but, you know, if you're not, then you can really just yeah. pay attention to yeah. it, you know. I mean, we each have our own row, and you kind of lay back and, like, um, it's exciting. <laughs> Do you often listen to your own stuff? Yeah, on occasion. I mean, usually I don't listen to us because, uh, well, after a long tour or so, you really don't want to listen to any music, you know, because um, you just you just been hurt enough, you know. <laughs> but um, give a couple weeks for your ears to stop. Reading. Yeah, but I mean, but while you're on tour, it's like you know, it's exciting to hear new stuff. And CJ's really cool like that because being, I guess, the youngest, he's like really into all kinds of stuff. Uh -huh. I mean, he's really open-minded. I mean, we're, we're open-minded too, but you know, it's a little, it's a little, when you, when you get on a bit, it's like, you know, you're not so enthusiastic. Uh, well, you, every new thing. You, right. You, you, it's more, you know, certain periods that you, you, you know, really want to hear. I mean, CJ really turns me on to all kinds of stuff. I've, I've heard a lot of new bands that I maybe, you know, might have missed. Them. Might have missed, like, yeah. um, you know, and uh, you know, some of them are good and some of them are whatever, you know. Well, there's a lot out there too to try and get through it all, you know, and pay attention to remember what was this one that you heard that you liked, and you know, what was the other one that. And then I can turn him on to stuff that he's not familiar with, too, mm -hmm. which, so. and he's like really, really open. I mean. I don't know, like I heard, um, well, when we were touring Australia recently, um, we had that band, The Hard Ons, on tour with us, and they're, they're great, they're a lot of fun, and the new album is really good, you know, it's really good, and uh, so, it was funny, because they play with us every night, but I didn't, I didn't get to hear their, uh, their sure newest have. album they have out, mm. and it's really good, yeah, and I said, wow, I wish I would have heard it when we were on tour with them, so I could tell them. Yeah. <laughs> thing I've heard that I really, you know, love is the new Jane's Addiction album, you know, and the new Motorhead album's great too. But. What I've heard of it, I like, I just listened to the whole thing again. Well, I like that Ramon song, I think, <laughs> I think that's the best song on the record. A lot of people don't seem to know about that yet, you know, I mentioned it to people here and there, they're like, what, wow, you know, Motorhead. Yeah. yeah. And let me say, well, you guys got to write a song about us now. <laughs> I was wondering if that was in the offing, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, well, it's funny. Well, he already wrote a song about them. I mean, Motorhead goes back to Hawkwind. Well, that was Hawkwind, you know? yeah. Right, yeah. so we got the name. Right. But then I think they redid it, didn't they? Well, he's, well they got the name Motorhead from that guy in Frank Zappa's band, the um, baseball. What's that guy's name? Oh. He, he, uh, I forgot the guy's name. I but know, he, I know who something you mean. Something Motorhead. He was like, uh, was in, like it's in, I can even see the guy's picture from the, the album. Guy was <laughs> Yeah, just take, maybe take it off the hook or something. Yeah. 
Centric, I think, cheap trick, you know. And um, I don't think that. I think I. I mean, I'm. A, I've always been a big cheap trick fan. I mean, I got into them in '76, and uh, and I, you know, I, you know, I, I used to like them. I still like. I like their older stuff, you yeah. know. But I really don't think that they would have pulled it off the way we did, you know, because. Um, They don't different have a real personality. No, they Most don't. Guys. I don't yeah. even know what kind of following they got. You know, um, they just like don't click in with. Uh, you know, I mean, they're you know you you can like them, but you just. Uh, Is it because like, they're just too much of rock stars? Yeah, well, I think they're too rock, too big rock, too big of like Rick Nelson and all. They're Nielsen. more manufactured Rick, personality Rick Nielsen, than yeah. an authentic. Yeah, they're not authentic, yeah. right? and I don't think that uh, they they really click in with with kids. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think that even then, you know, because I mean, I was in high school when that stuff was out, and they kind of went right by me. I don't know. They were all right, but. <laughs> well, I, I really liked <laughs> um, you know, in color and the first film. And I liked the earliest stuff, you know. I, I mean, they were, good album. they were they were good. They were good. I mean, they you know, I mean. The thing I liked about them was that a lot of the, you know, a lot of the bands that I like were in their music, mm -hmm. or they were in their music. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the Who and all that stuff, and the Beatles and all that stuff. Yeah. You know, and um, and I think that's probably you know had a lot to do with why you know they were like a hard, hard Beatles or something, <laughs> <laughs> right? But uh, Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. What were they? Well, they were, they were good though. I, I like that, you know? I mean, but they really are, um, now you don't even hear about them anymore, right? Just now they're just bad. bad. They're they, just bad. They got back together, but it's just, it's, I don't know, it's just the sellout commercial rock. That that, that, they sound like everybody money. else. Yeah, they do. I mean, they, they were good for that time period, for the 70s. They yeah. were perfect. Oh, I like them. I, I always liked Rick Nielsen. I always thought he was a really talented writer and, uh, and uh, Robin Zander was, you know, had a really good voice, and they were exciting, they were fun, and uh, and Bunny, he was, you know, he's like, he's a cool guy, he's a record collector, and uh, yeah. and the other guy, whatever. Carlos. No, huh? that Carlos. That Carlos. Bunny Carlos. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, and, there's, the, there's uh, and then there was a, that other guy. Tom Peterson. Tom Peterson, right? The, but they're like a bunch the player of, of the twelve string bass. They're phonies, okay. you know. They're phonies. Like I hung out with them once and or twice, and you know, and you know, back in the when we used to do drugs and shit. <laughs> I, I somehow, I somehow can't see Riff Randall camping out for three days for Rick Nielsen, though. <laughs> Especially uh, when she would find out that he's got no hair, right? <laughs> <laughs> Is that why he wears that hat all the time? <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, what was it like making that movie, though? Well, you know, you know what's funny about like, um, like with Stephen King and ourselves, right? Like Stephen, every time he'd have a book party in New York, he'd, he'd ask, he'd um, contact us to like, um, you know, come by there because he's a big Ramones fan and we're, um, you know, big Stephen King fans, and um, so like he'd always like invite us to his book party so we could finally meet each other. But we'd always be on the road, you know. So um, finally, in 1984, he promoted a concert in Bangor, Maine, which is his home, and it was us and Cheap Trick, right? <laughs> and uh, so, like, I, you know, I and I, I, you know, um, and it was good. It was a really good show, you know. And I remember, um, you know, he invited us out for dinner afterwards.
records and, and then over to his house, you know. But he didn't invite, you know, Rick Nielsen or Cheap Trick, you know, which uh, I thought was pretty funny, you know. And, um, and like, it really bugged that rep. He was, he was very upset about that. But uh, he deserved it. <laughs> but uh, that's, that, that's my uh, cheap, cheap Trick story. So what about uh, Rock and Roll High School? Yeah, what was, it, what was it like actually making the movie? I mean, it looked like it was great fun. I, the movie itself is, is, is a riot to watch, but it looks like it must have been like great fun to make. Yeah, it was a lot of work, you know. I mean, it was cool because, I mean, everybody was really cool on the set, and, um, and Mary Warnoff was great, and, um, you know, everybody was really cool, you know. But it, making a film is just, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of sitting around and uh, a lot of waiting time and, you know, long hours and, uh, but it was, it was a new experience for us. I mean, you know, we had never done anything like that before and it was really cool. It was, um, you know, but it was very time consuming, you know. Were, were mean, you surprised that you were asked to do it? It was, it was like a, kind of an honor, the fact that it was, um, Roger Corman, and we were always big Roger Corman fans, you know, we were always big, you know, kind of B-film type fans and stuff, you know, and he's king of the bees, like, you know, and, uh, and it was really cool, you know, going out to L.A., which, you know, we had been out there, but this, we were kind of based there now for, um, well, it took about, I guess it was three weeks to, to do the stuff we had done, and, uh, and then right after that, we did the album with Phil Spector. So we, you know, we kind of we went back to New York, and then we um, worked our way back out to L.A. And then we kind of based ourselves in the Tropicana Hotel for about three months, and did the, did, did the album with Phil, you know. And the thing that was wild about it was to kind of keep the you know the money coming in, you know, so that we could base ourselves out there was. We were we did a kind of a tour with uh, Black Sabbath, and <laughs> which was which there. was <laughs> it was kind of well it was like we had um, that's when Sawyer merged with Warner Brothers and we um, and Warner Brothers and we had just something gone with Premier Talent and and it was funny like well it wasn't funny but for, for a lot of years we couldn't get a, a, a booking agent you know like um, and. Um, I think we went through all of them and a lot of strange situations. Uh, and then, um, so like Warner Brothers felt this would be a good way for us to get more uh, mass exposure, go out with Black Sabbath. And we, we tried to tell them, we didn't think it was a very good idea, but they thought, oh, they know better than us. So, you know, we kind of said, oh, okay, you know. So we, the first show we had done was in, uh, Atlanta and at the Omni and um, it was like you know I guess playing like Madison Square Gardens or something like that and it was um, it was Black Sabbath Van Halen and ourselves and it was it was the tour that Van Halen were out opening tour. up for huh? 78 tour yeah they were that was they were out opening for us for Sabbath and I remember um, it's Ozzy's last tour right well the thing with, with Sabbath in those days I mean they just, they didn't, uh, they, they would, they would never, uh, you know, they were very strange towards us, you know what I mean? <laughs> we never, you know, actually even seen, you know, they, they were weird. Van Halen were really cool though, we got to be friends with them, and uh, they were cool. But they were, they were only on that one show with us, you know? And then, um, and then when we did these, a bunch of shows out in California with them, um, and it was it was a, a very strange pairing, you know. And um, I remember like one show. This was probably one of the you know, people say, you know, what's you you have that one memorable show uh -huh. where it was maybe a total fiasco or whatever, you know. <laughs> and it was this is the one show that you know is like I guess the most memorable when people say, well, you know, you have any really good stories about that one show, you know? So like we were playing out in San Bernardino. And that's like real redneck um, out in California. It's like all farmers and um, 
and motorcycle farm is. And, and so we were we were out <laughs> and like the promoter they build it, you know, um, the, the like the brilliance of this promoter, he build it. Um, the heavy, um, what is it? the kings of heavy metal verse, the kings of punk, punk rock, rock, to make it kind of like a like a, a battle, you know, yeah, or something, bands, right? no, which was a really good way to promote a show, you know. So like, um, so we we go on, you know, and um, and like, you know, the fact that they they have a, a few more fans than we do, right? Like, especially um, at that time. Yeah, well, out. especially at that time. Because that was, yeah. that was, well, whenever well, that was. It was 78. It was about 78, yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. I remember clearing parties out with Chris Ramon's album, you know, around that. All these stoner kids, you put that out, and they just, like, you know, couldn't handle yeah. it. Yeah. Well, it was, I mean, I don't know. It was sometimes, I mean, we would always headline our own shows, and that would be, work out great. But, like, when... At, there was one period when, you know, like the promoters, or I don't know, some for some reason people thought we should, you know, kind of do a go out on a bill. Uh huh. So we, you know, we we did some strange bills, exposure. you know, right? We did some weird bills. We did a bill with Farna and, and Minnesota. <laughs> it was like Ooh. 19 below zero. I remember, like, it was, the place was just frozen over, and uh, but but we had a thousand fans up front, so. It worked out really good, and um, we went out with Toto. You know, <laughs> Saint, These are getting better. In Saint Charles, Saint Charles, Louisiana, or some. It was, um, it was that was weird because the audience just like looked at us and like like we were from from <laughs> out of this world. <laughs> and that was just, that was like you know, and it, and it took us like ten hours to get there from where we were. We didn't even want to do it. And it was like, what? we did, we just played nine shows in a row and it would be, would be the 10th show. And uh, we, we went out there and like, it was like, you know, ridiculous, you know. Yeah. But we had a really good like, um, like, um, I don't know, we, we had a good food fight in the dressing room and I remember that, you know. And, um, all right, so getting back to this, um, the story, Black the Black Sabbath, Sabbath no. story, right? So, all right, so then, so we went, when we stopped playing and, um, in front of us were all these like motorcycle like farmer types, you know, and a lot of them were like drinking like these, um, you know, those eighth of, you know, fifth of whiskey, those kind of, you oh, know, okay. and um, they were like, they, they'd kind of be acting like they were going to throw them at you, but not letting them go, you know, uh -huh. and so we were, you know, so we were playing and we were, I guess we were like, um, about 20 minutes in, and in those days, you know, when you know when you're opening up, you do a shorter set and the whole bit, you know, and um, and I guess uh, I guess about Surfing Bird, all of a sudden, like everything in the world came at us, you know, like these whiskey bottles and carburetors and spark plugs, <laughs> and, and but you know we were able to dodge all these uh, all these uh, implements coming at us, and you know nobody got hit or hurt or anything, and. Uh, and then, like somebody threw a, a, an ice pick, and it landed right by John's foot, and um, and we just said, you know, it's, it's time to fucking Enough go. That. So we, we gave him the finger, and we walked off the stage, and there was this uh, this like 95 year old stage manager, you know, and he and he was like on um, backstage, and he said, the last time I saw a reaction like that was the first time the Rolling Stones played America. So that was uh, kind of a, a real compliment, you know what I mean? So that kind of made you feel. Motorhead kind of got that response in Cleveland when they opened up for Ozzy Osbourne's first solo tour and everything. They played at Music Hall, a little 3,000 seat place. And it was the first time Motorhead had been here and people were there to see Ozzy Osbourne and stuff and they booed Motorhead off the stage. Uh -huh. And that was, he, he kind of flipped the fans off that night too. Let me yeah. do it. <laughs> that was, that was kind of funny. Well, it was hard for us in those days because it really was nothing like us and um, and all that was in America was metal, heavy metal, like, you know, like Ted, or, Ted or Nugent dinosaur and rock, Arrows, you know? yeah, the dinosaur yeah. stuff, you know. Right. Like that's that what was yeah, happening. That's what, I remember doing, we did a, a festival in Toronto that was, kind of, I guess, something like what you were talking about, with, like what happened to Motorhead. It was like, I don't know why they put us on this festival at all, because um, it was like, it was, one, the monster, it was like a monsters of, you know, heavy metal monsters kind uh -huh. of thing. 
and it was like, I think it, this tour probably circulated around America too. It was um, Ted Nugent and Aerosmith and um, Black Sabbath and. I think that one played. Uh, with the, the yeah, stadium. there was there were six bands on the bill. It was Aerosmith, Ted Nugent, Thin Lizzy, Scorpions, First Time in America, Foreigner, and. Um, one other band. And the remote. <laughs> so, so anyway, so like we're, we're playing Blue Jay Stadium and they flew us up, you know, just to play the show. And, and it was pretty impressive, you know, like um, they were like kind of really kind of taking good care of you and, uh, and really kind of looking after you. And then it was time for us to go on and they sent us a limousine. Well, where the stage was to where the back, the dressing room was, was very large, so they drive you out to the stage, right? And um, and then we got up there and, you know, and it was kind of scary because there was like, you know, like, like there was a giant baseball stage. 7,500,000 And people. also the fact that it was billed as, as a metal show and we, we weren't, we're not a metal band or weren't, you know, a metal band or whatever the fuck. So um, we go out and start playing and um, I don't think these people would, knew what to expect, you know, because, um, you know, like one band would kind of sludge by and then you know, they like kind of sludge by and like um and then we're going on and then, you know and there's a you know what i mean and um all of a sudden like they started we ba bags of bloody sandwiches were coming up there and all kinds of shit was coming up there you know and um you know and we walked off and it was you know and but you know and john you know right and uh the whole bit and um and it was you know kind of Degrading, you know what I mean? And then we went back, and then Steven Tyler came back, and you know he he was pretty cool, you know, and he yeah. was he was getting off on it and all this. And then I realized what a little guy he is, very tiny. I think he's he's bigger now than he used to be. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I remember he was kind of short. Well, know? he looked down on everybody though. <laughs> no, no, but he's, I just saw him recently, and uh, and he was bigger now. And. Um, He's got the Grim. biggest mouth I've ever seen. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, but those days are kind of over, and and uh, things are like totally different now than they were then. Well, uh, you could probably get away on a bill like that today, with the stuff that you with doing. with the equivalent bands of today, which would be something like maybe Guns N' Roses, yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. Well, like now. well, all the all those bands now have all kind of. I mean, rock and roll has really changed now. I mean, it's it's just a it's a blend now of, you know, like uh, where punk and metal and this and that, you know. I mean, this, everything is kind of a, is a blend, like you know, it's like with Metallica and the whole, and that's what's the accepted metal now. I mean, it's bands like you know, Metallica and Megadeth and yeah. you know, the Motorhead, which were almost. Know. The, the punk rock of metal bands a few and, years ago. Yeah, know? right. I mean, the sludge doesn't make it nowadays. And um, so, I mean, the, the Ramones, or, you know, I mean, a lot of people, um, because of the uh, the connection between punk and metal, you know, um, I mean, I mean, uh, a lot of them were considered in some, some circles as punk metal or whatever. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, um, well, really, it's, it's never been... Punk all that far apart musically but just people would get into their camps and like well, oh people, you're punk rock well you know well that was always too like in Europe I mean everyone's very open minded and it's, and it's the music not um, you know I mean barriers just fuck it up for everybody you know what I mean uh -huh. and um, in America there was always barriers well if you if you played this then we can't like we can't like if you play this we're gonna like if you play that you know what I mean and you know, if you play metal, then you can't play punk. But it, you know, if, and if you're a punk band, then we can't like you to play metal. It's like, like real stupid. You know, yeah. real, real. Uh, well, it's still kind of like that in Cleveland. You know? It's like a lot of the punk kids like metal bands, but like the strict metal kids, a good number of them, it's like really Don't hate like the, the punk bands. Yeah. You know, and it's like they wouldn't get caught dead in a show until there. their favorite metal band shows up wearing one of their T-shirts. Then suddenly it becomes acceptable. You know, it's like I, I think like the wildest thing about us too. Um, I guess in the early well, when things started like you know moving along, I mean, you'd see all these kids with like Ozzy Osbourne shirts and uh, 
Arrow Smith shirt and this shirt and that shirt. You know, you knew that these kids were like seeing you for the first time. Uh -huh. And when and when they left, they were fans, you know. And it was that was like the coolest thing. And I mean, like, I mean, it's always sort of been that way where we, our fans are from all different walks of life and different backgrounds and different musical backgrounds. I mean, it, you know, like um, I remember some of the wildest things where I remember uh, once we were in. Um, I don't know, we were at 7 Eleven or something, and some kid came up and he said, My two favorite bands are you guys and the Grateful Dead, you know? <laughs> but there was, lot, I saw a kid wearing a dead shirt tonight, and I was thinking. You know, but in a lot of ways, there's a real definite similarity as far as, like, uh, you know, the dead always, you know, stuck by, you know, they always, I mean, like, they're you know, sort of in the cult kind of thing. Is, uh, yeah. You know, the, you know, they are who they are, and you know. You know, you know right, you know who they dead. are, and, and you know who we are, you know. Uh -huh. They were stuck by their guns too, you know, you know, and they did it their way. So I, you know, give them a lot of credit. I mean, I, I, I uh, res you know, respect anybody who fucking was doing something, you know, res you know that they, you know, they stuck, they stuck to their vision. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something that they continue to believe in. Right. Something right. that they believe in. I mean, it doesn't really. I don't. I'm not one. Uh, well, you know, I like liking this, not liking that. I'm, you know, I mean. I, it's like, um, I don't know. Basically, you know, this is. You Sadie. have to tell me what to do. I'm not Basically, this is this has been Sadie. Okay, I've been Sadie. I will continue to be Sadie, and you will continue to be Joey Ramone, and this will continue to be Vidbag Television, won't it? Yes, but sir. the interview is over. Kaput, deceased. Goodbye. See ya.